you for uh, showing up for uh, this this talk. We have um, with us uh, Keith Osborne, and we will we have a couple slides um, about bios and stuff. So we'll we'll cover that in just a moment. Um, Right now we have, uh, this is gonna go through the agenda here, and this is gonna be more of a conversational um, piece than more, more than anything anything else. I only have a total of, I think, five slides, six slides, something like that. So um, we're gonna do introductions. Um, then we're gonna talk about the uh, how the Department of Education of Georgia is currently using WordPress. Um, then we're gonna talk about what is happening in the future, uh, hopefully. No, uh, knock on wood, right? Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about secur security and stability, and then we're going to do Q and A. Um, and most of you, at least this half of the room, I think most of you guys know me, but I'll, I'll do I'll do my slide anyway. Um, so uh, my name is Aaron. I'm a father of uh, four uh, from the ages of ten to twenty, um, and three girls, one one boy. The last one was a boy, so you know uh, we're done. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I own an agency called Clockwork WP, and I my previous agency uh, was Sideways 8, um, and some of my employees are here that are going to ask me uh, tough questions, I'm sure. Um, and um, I'm obviously an organizer at WordCamp, um, and I have a LinkedIn profile, and I didn't know that that was going to be there. Way to go, Gina. So thank you. So um, And I'll hand it over to uh, Keith. And that's got to be like one of the longest LinkedIn profiles I think that I've seen. Yeah. Right, so right. That, I, I don't know what the correspondence of those numbers are, but they've got to do something. Thank you, everybody. Uh, l let me start by saying um, I am so glad that WordCamp is back because I, I was at the, the one, what was it, three years ago? Three and a half, yeah. And uh, honestly, that was, I think, the first time that you and I met uh, from that standpoint. And so lots happened since those days. So uh, everybody, thank you again for letting me be with you today. So I work for the Georgia Department of Education, uh, a little tiny thing that deals with, uh, let's see, 222 districts, 2,548 schools, 300,000 staff members, and 1.8 million children. Uh, so I frequently just sit at work and twiddle my thumbs thinking about, you know, is there anything for us to do? No, I just, uh, quite honestly, I, I'm thrilled to be able to do the work that I do. So I represent one of seven deputies uh, that work for the elected state school superintendent, Richard Woods. Uh, my world is, is all things technology, both for the department, but also uh, beginning to, to think about how, how, what, does, what does educational technology look like uh, and how does it support student learning in K-12? Uh, and so some of that conversation I'm sure will unfold today. Uh, some other things about me. Um, I'm, I'm a father of four as well too, and I, I just got to give a little bonus of the fact that I'm, it's a proud dad moment for me because my oldest uh, son just happens to be sitting right here, uh, and he's a developer for GM, and so he, was, he thought he wasn't going to be doing anything this weekend. I was like, well, you are now. You're coming with your father. <laughs> Uh, to WordPress, and so in the event he has to get up and run out, it's because it's it's not because he's offended by me or anything. It's because he's he's got a gazillion things that are going on over there. Uh, but other than that, uh, I certainly uh, have forever uh, and a day been uh, a huge technology enthusiast. Uh, a, a WordPress. Uh, uh, Aaron and I were talking about that. I don't know how long I've been in it, so I just simply put the words "too long." Uh, but I do date back to the day. Uh, Raj, uh, some of you know Raj around here. Raj and I were talking at lunch, and he was like, well, when did you get into this industry? And I was like, my first computer had two five-and-a-quarter floppies, no hard drives. Uh, so that's how far back it goes. And then uh, was, that, was that a PC Junior? So No. Because mine had two five-and-a-quarter floppies. A, it was a K-Pro PC. It had a processor that was uh, a four or eight uh, megahertz, and you had to slow it down to play Tetris. I mean, that's how, that's how fast that computer was. That's how old uh, to that point. So I've been, uh, been in the industry for a good bit. So anyway, so yeah, on. Fair enough. Thank you. All right, so we're going to hit you up with some questions. Um, and this is just some uh, bulleted uh, list to kind of keep, keep me focused as, as we ask questions. Um, so uh, the Department of Education of Georgia has a few um, websites that are WordPress. Uh, so my question to you, question one is, um, uh, what do you use WordPress for at Godot? So uh, great question. Uh, as you might imagine, we, we have an incredibly large, um, um, you know, kind of data uh, presence and uh, technology entrance, if you will. 
uh, that really now uh, we're in the in the final days of, of kind of leveraging the cloud in totality. We're moving completely off of off, off prem. A lot of the conversation around that modernization event uh, began uh, during the dreaded pandemic, right? Because as we well know, the society shut down in the absence of about forty eight hours, uh, and it was during that time that it, 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 we socially distanced. You know, again, 1.8 million children and 122,000 teachers. We said, go home and figure out how to teach. Uh, and that became uh, probably a, a real uh, uh, entry point for me to begin thinking about um, how, how, do we, how do we facilitate, how do we support education? Uh, and here's an opportunity for technology to rise to that occasion. One of the most critical things amongst teachers is the ability to communicate. And whenever you've suddenly socially distanced those, imagine that if you're a science teacher, you need to talk to other science teachers about what's working. How do I how do I do this thing? How do I work with these children? You know what 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 are some resources that you're using in the midst of that? And so we really, um, you know, my 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 team, my my leadership team, we sat down and we began to think about this idea of saying, uh, how do we facilitate that in the world of technology? And that was our entry point uh, because this is when, uh, you know, I jokingly say that as the CIO, I'm I never get. To touch a keyboard. In fact, I tell everybody I drink coffee and read the newspaper because my developers are like, you're not touching nothing. You're not going in our server farm. You're not doing anything for so many reasons. But uh, some of they pick on me because I'm old. But um, I was like, you know, I, w I went home one afternoon and I really sat down and began to kind of prototype on the idea and WordPress kind of came to play. And so I built something. It was called the community. Uh, and it was just the idea to really think about could we possibly facilitate something? And again, looking at the ability for us to go from, from nothing to something very rapidly was, was really critical and being very agile and responsive. Uh, and then the darn thing just went and got successful. And then at that point in time, what was just a couple of people suddenly was 5,000 people and then it was 10,000 people. And then, well, now it's, you know, half of 100,000 people and it's growing by 500 people every week as we continue to build this, what we call our community. Uh, and it was really born on the idea of saying, could, could technology facilitate uh, conversations uh, where people are socially distanced? And so to this day, it's, it continues to be incredibly effective. It was just in the midst of that, that uh, I had bought, built something that was very monolithic. Uh, everything from the database, including the, 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 the front end GUI, was all on one box. And you can imagine that works great whenever you've got 25 people. It doesn't work so well whenever you've got 58,000 people that are hammering that box. And so um, I happened to be on a, on, on a call one day, one of the evening uh, WordPress uh, kind of events that were happening. There was a guy by the name of Aaron that was talking about something. And, and at the end of that, I was like, hey, Aaron, will you, uh, will you hang on to the call for a minute? And we began to kind of talk about that. Uh, and that really began to develop a relationship between myself and Aaron and our teams. Uh, and really, that is uh, something that continues to this day. Uh, not only to be a sustainable feature for the department to be able to support the teacher workforce, but it's growing by leaps and bounds because obviously we've seen the agility of this, uh, as, as you will talk about later, some of the scalability and, and just really the governance model around what we're able to do with this. Uh, and it's been a, a hugely successful case for us. So, so what, is, uh, what does community uh, do as far as um, what, what functionality does it does it give them? So it's it's a protected environment uh, for again the teachers of Georgia to come and say I want to have a conversation with another science teacher, or if you're an English teacher I want to have a conversation with another English teacher, or maybe all of the English teachers. Maybe I want to have a conversation. Maybe I want to share materials with you, uh, and so that has truly been built on the idea that we can personalize, if you will, around a specific content area or a thought or a theme where we can enable that conversation and, and, if you will, the vulnerability of question asking uh, to happen within that protected community. And so uh, it is, I say protected because it is, it's membership driven. Uh, and even then, uh, somebody has to apply for membership in the midst of that. They have to validate through their email address and whatnot that they are indeed a Georgia teacher or a professor or, or you know, a college student that's coming into their pathway there. Uh, and that's the way that they get into the midst of that. So, yeah. Cool. What, um... Do you want to talk about any of the plugins or any of the the, the, the core like membership or gravity? Uh, yeah. Maybe just a couple of those or certainly, you know, the, the, the critical piece that you just heard me talk about was really ensuring that we protected that community. What we wanted it for teachers, 
uh, and for other teachers to be a part of that and, and really to be able to converse about what was very important to them. And so this is whenever the finesse of, of really looking at WordPress really begin to kind of come into play and we begin to think about some of those plugins and how do we use those specifically. Obviously, uh, you know, the membership driven aspect of that was critical. Uh, and then really the other pieces of that were, we're beginning to kind of glean some information, not just specifically from our users, but also the ability for me uh, to take very large scale data sets and begin to, to both, first off, obfuscate those. Uh, and then began to look at, uh, you know, trend analyses about what's happening across the state, who's using this, you know, what's the frequency of their use, you know, when are they logging in, whatnot. And so the, the plugins and the choices for those were really driven by some of those needs as we began to kind of see the scale up uh, of this application. So, yeah, so I don't really, probably most everybody in here has some degree of technicality. So if we want to get into some technical, um, you know, components of that, please, by all means, ask. Um, what I don't know, I'll make up, uh, or I'll say, hey, Aaron, uh, tell the truth about those in that particular space. And, so, and if I don't know, I'll ask Marty, my yeah, developer, yeah, on it. So, so, Good old um, Marty over there. So, uh -huh. Yeah. So, so they have, um, so Godot has community. It also has a professional learning site. Um, do you want to talk about um, professional learning? And yes. What, what, okay. So, um, so to that point, um, you know, we saw such great success with the community. Uh, one of the big... Uh, components of, of really what's happening in the world of education right now is that you know, certainly if you think about, uh, I oftentimes tell people that prior to the pandemic, technology and education was still very much a gee whiz bang thing. You know, a teacher could take it or leave it. Uh, during that transformational time of the pandemic, uh, technology switched from what was a gee whiz bang thing to being mission critical. You know, as we're, as we're fond to say, in 2019, a teacher reached for a textbook. Today, she reaches for technology. And so we began to think about, all right, if that's the case, then technology needs to be very seamless. It's got to be transparent and it cannot get in the way of learning. Uh, and the problem with technology in the past has been oftentimes the third, that, that cur third bullet hasn't been the case. Oftentimes it gets in the way. Teachers have to roster these applications. They have to figure out how to use this application. It doesn't necessarily nestle in with what they're doing. And so we really have been very dogmatic about the design and the and really chasing down those types of things that ultimately reduce the amount of time that is required of a teacher to be able to use that technology to some benefit. And one of the things that we've seen specifically is how do we take otherwise very discrete applications, pieces that are here and pieces that are there and pieces that are over there, and how do we bring those together and co-join them in such a way that not only conversationally are they organized for teachers, but they're also within, say, dare a mouse click. And, you know, so I'm the guy that sets the trends inside of the department. And so specifically my, del my dev team, I tell them, you get three mouse clicks and you get 10 seconds. And if you can't deliver the information in 10 seconds and three mouse clicks, go back to the drawing board because imagine yourself being a fifth grade math teacher right after lunch when 30 kids have been out on the playground and they're hot and sweaty and you have 10 seconds of silence, that's, that's a death sentence for a teacher. So like you better get that information into your hands very rapidly. And so we began to really think about, again, what are, you, what are we doing that's successful? Community is a great success point. What else do teachers need? They need things like uh, professional learning, uh, some other things like newsletters and whatnot. And so those are literally beginning to be part of, uh, again, a single storefront, if you will, but an opportunity for our teachers and others uh, to be able to kind of find the materials that they need to consume almost immediately within uh, getting initially to that site. The professional learning site, was one of those first hangoffs of the things that we were doing with the community. And this is where some conversations said, all right, well, you know, again, we, we can't build one giant monolithic thing and just continue that on top of that. And so we really began to look at the dexterity of the environment and say, how do we better organize this? And so this was uh, probably the first instance of a headless version of, of yeah. Of so the, right? Yeah, basically community is set up uh, where it's password protected. No one can log in if you, you know, if you don't have a username and password, it just, you go there, it pops up username and password. But we had events, um, like the, the event submission and approval system, we needed to expose that, that piece of the information um, within WordPress. And so with the REST API, the WordPress REST API, we're able to query, pull the information out, and we have a basically a, a a headless um, instance of, of that. So that information can be exposed. Sure, um, sure. And, we, and we also, I, I totally forgot, we're, we're um, 
working on getting a mobile app um, okay. up, up and running too, uh, based Sorry. off of the data that's in community. Sure. Um, so it's 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 growing, um, and once we have that mobile app released, you know, we're I'm sure we're gonna have to add memory and CPU and all that all that stuff. Make sure it, it scales uh, properly. Um, so, but that I think that probably was the first um, big ex expansion mm -hmm. that sure. that we did once community um, you know came came to us where we were maintaining it. Um, and then the third thing was the uh, student chef. If you want to yep. talk about student chef. And so obviously the popularity of that uh, really began to kind of grow throughout the agency. And certainly, uh, as you can imagine, there's there's 1,500 people that work within the within the the kind of concentric circle of what's the Department of Ed. And and certainly as we begin to really kind of evangelize and market on the success of that, others within the agency began to say, well, we have needs. Uh, and really from that standpoint, how can technology services help us out? And so uh, one of those big ones was our nutrition uh, the department and specifically they run a, a, a contest each year uh, that really involves students and whatnot and so the, the the ask was hey can you help us can you support us and certainly realizing what the community project was doing um, our nutritionist uh, really came in and said um, obviously is this something that you guys can help us with and we certainly said yeah it's, well it's our job so we better uh, but from that standpoint can we reuse something that we've seen to be hugely successful and so from that was born our student chef uh, that's also um, uh, driven by WordPress there as well too. So yeah, so two big ones, and and you'll hear some more that uh, really we're we're doing a lot of st uh, strategic alignment around this conversation. You'll hear us continue to build off of that. So yeah, yeah, they keep they keep hitting us up with more and more more and more projects, which Warrior. which is which is good. So mm -hmm. um, on the horizon, um, we've got uh, we're just making sure I'm not running out of time here. Mm -hmm. So um, all right, so. What's going on with the Godot main site? So, um, so um, Department of Education now, at state level. Obviously, we run a, a, a pretty large scale website. Um, you know, because you know, tons of pieces of information are necessary for parents and uh, you know, folks that are moving in, whatever. From that standpoint, who need to know more about the Department of Education and what's happening across the state. Uh, you know, one of the things that that next came on the agenda as we were beginning to kind of modernize is looking at our overall site and, and seeing first and foremost that it's it's woefully out of date. Uh, you know, it was actually built uh, on a on a SharePoint uh, with an with an old template called Bind Tuning. Yeah, I, I, I see the cringe. You're, I, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Tums will be given out for those that need them. OK, so I, I'm with you. Okay, but from that standpoint, at one point, the superintendent came and he was like, you know, it's time. And I was like, well, gracious superintendent, you know, I, I only have a couple of other million things going on. We, we, we maintain a, a 135 other applications that are in-house. And so, uh, you know, those folks are busy. I'm drinking coffee. So, but in the midst of that, <laughs> superintendent says, you're going to be updating the website. Uh, and so as we began to kind of look at that, um, this, this internal conversation began to happen because obviously... Uh, we're in the business of people and we're in the business of serving information out to those and so really thinking about not just the idea of, of, of what a website did, but in this modern age of saying what does a website do, what should it do, uh, and on top of that how can we begin to uh, really think about efficiencies and kind of modifying the culture within an apartment that was really kind of paper driven prior to the pandemic uh, to one that really is kind of digital first. And so this is where conversations began to have uh, around, uh, you know, unfortunately I was in a meeting one day where I, I threw out the term CMS and everybody looked at me and they're like, I have no idea what that is. And you're like, well, okay, content management system. And they're like, you better throw me more. And so we really began to, to get into a kind of a, a cultural exchange of saying in this day, as we begin to think about uh, information, storing it is not the, the period at the end of the sentence. Story in it is really the start of the sentence and really doing a good job about the way that you do that is is going to play into the effectiveness of, of really being able to kind of provide that information to stakeholders uh, in an organized palatable fashion when they need it and, 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 and again in a very agile fashion. And so again, you know, the communication aspect and that conversation begin to really grow and say, well, we, we've had some successes, you know, these things that we've been doing. Uh, and thus began to think about, you know, what do we do with our site as a, as a whole. Um, they didn't like me because, uh, you know, the first thing I said was that we're, we're not going to upgrade the previous site. We're not. 
uh, for all the reasons technically that, that you were shaking your head, but on top of that, uh, there were instances where you know pieces of information were probably more than a decade old, probably not real relevant for today. And so, you know, again, I get to be the guy that says, you know, that site's going into archive state, uh, which really liberated the opportunity for us to begin thinking about what, what does the 21st century look like, and specifically what should a website begin to look like. Uh, and then was born the idea of saying, uh, we've had some success with, with really approaching this from a CMS stack. Uh, and really kind of building around that, but also beginning to think about this collaborative nature of an agency. Uh, and then the, the conversation about WordPress began to enter in. And it re wasn't even my idea, which meant that something I said eventually rattled off onto somebody had stuck because they brought that up. And I was like, well, you've had a very good idea. Let's explore that. Uh, and that really began to uh, kind of build upon the conversation where uh, we brought in obviously teams to say, um, Kind of help us let's let's do a little background work and let's just do some uh, kind of forensic discovery about what's been there all the all the various hands that have touched that uh, and really begin to kind of build on a long-term project and i say long term but actually we're going to bring that thing to fashion you know pretty rapidly you know. by january 1st right by january 1st <laughs> no in, in no. a world where in, in a world where you know it's uh uh where it's where it's not atypical for you know it, it takes two years for a project to start uh, you know, this agility and, and responsiveness that we see is uh, certainly something new uh, kind of in the kind of the public sector, if you will. Uh, and again, whenever you've got proven technologies that you can begin to kind of stack off of and build off of uh, both the cultural piece, but also the application layer of that uh, really kind of shows the pragmatic value of that. And so uh, as with that, that we really looked at the, this whole idea of saying we're going to aggressively look at our overall site. Uh, and, and from the very front to, to the, the, the metrics in the background of, of the way that we work uh, across the agency, uh, we're going to build a website that's actually a utility for us and not just a dissemination of information from that standpoint. So uh, that will pretty soon. So you guys, so obviously those are, uh, all the URLs are, are definitely the ones that we're using um, you know, from that standpoint. Again, you can see the front end of the community is like uh, Aaron was saying a second ago, obviously ghetto.org is still up, uh, but there will be a very clandestine moment one night where you might look at it at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and whenever you see it the next morning at, at uh, you know 8 o'clock or whatever, if you happen to do that on like a Saturday morning, uh, you might see a new site and you'll know that that uh, is really built on a CMS stack, uh, specifically WordPress in the background. It's actually, again, not monolithic, but uh, just simply due to the size and all the diversity of, of information pathways that come into that. Uh, it will be built upon that whole idea. So, yeah, tons of that. And um, um, we were, I can't remember the session that we were in earlier, but really beginning to kind of think about, um, you know, how do, how, do we, how do we serve information very rapidly? Uh, we, we really began to uh, kind of conceptualize further on this idea of the, of the whole idea of, you know, what is, what is our CMS if we run it headless and then we put something like a, a Next.js or something on the front end of that. Uh, to really be able to kind of take advantage of some of the more modernistic uh, components and the ways that we do those types of things. And so that's really the expectation of, of the pathway that we're headed. Uh, and if you have technical, uh, further technical questions about that, unless it's something like orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, ask him <laughs> because that's yeah. his pathway. Yeah, that we'll, what we're going to do with that is we're going to have a headless uh, WordPress um, instance uh, for that, uh, mainly because I, I kind of see this site as it, it needs to last 10 years. You know, the, the information needs to be there for a very long time. And by, by just using WordPress as a headless um, CMS, um, it's, we're going to build a custom front end uh, to pull that data out. And then in five years, when that's old technology and something better has come in, we, in theory, <laughs> don't, don't hold me to this. No worries, <laughs> hold me to no this. Worries. But, you know, in theory, in five years, be able to, you know, swap that out and still have the same back end and not have to redo all of the content. Um, so that's, that's the, my goal uh, with that. So in, in theory, in 10 years, you know, it's the content should still be good enough. Um, and then, I mean, I'm sure it'll have to be maintained sure. and all of that. Um, and another thing that we're gonna we're gonna do for for that is we're gonna have a um, a content uh, submission and approval system uh, for for basically everything post pages media all all of that that um, uh, Gina told me uh, today that they um, 
she can't find a plugin that does it and does it well. So we're gonna we're gonna write a, a plugin to do that um, and make it because uh, we need to be very um, we have to have full control over what what's being submitted, how it's approved, and all that stuff. So we're gonna do something custom for that, and then our um, the the other site that we're gonna do um, that's that uh, we kicked off last week, uh, mm -hmm. maybe maybe two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, is the uh, teacher uh, retention site. Yep. You yep. want to talk about the three R's? Yeah, I'm going to go back one and just oh, mention okay. one other thing too that really is important to us and, and um, it, it's a term that I, I've told Aaron many times that I've uh, just without uh, without shame have stolen from him. Uh, that you can imagine whenever you deal in a, in a very large scale kind of public facing instance, uh, a, a, sometimes a simple word or a simple conversation can actually cause a, just almost a media storm to happen. Uh, and I remember a very early conversation that uh, Aaron and I had many, many years ago where he talked about something called the Oprah moment. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? An Oprah moment? You know, Oprah gets on TV and she holds up a book and she says, this was a great book. And then the next day, the whole world sells out, right? Because Oprah said it. Okay. Um, so there are instances where we have that as well, too. And so um, one, of the, one of the additional things that we've had uh, is really to consider, you know, how do you build for the Oprah moment? Uh, and this is really where um, uh, somebody was saying earlier, this is where planning uh, really ensures performance, uh, you know, from that standpoint. And so you can imagine the conversations that have happened where uh, it's, it's not, there's, I don't know, there's probably, there's probably between five and 10,000 people on the site right now. I don't know why people need to go to the education site on a Saturday afternoon at 2.20 when the, when the dogs are winning, but that's near here or there, whatever their business is, so be it. Uh, but you can imagine there have been events like the governor announcing that we're going to close because of a pandemic and suddenly it goes from 10,000 uh, to literally swelling over, you know, 250 to 300,000 users that are simultaneously trying to hit this site. And it's never good whenever they're met with a 404 page or, you know, something from that standpoint. And so we have to try and figure out how do, how do we govern against that? Uh, and so really, again, a, a lot of, of what we've been talking about, that's always in the back of our minds. Uh, you know, if I go back to the very uh, monolithic application of community that I told you about, whenever you build, whenever, you, whenever you've got MySQL and you've got a CMS stacked on top of that, and you've got a GUI, imagine on that, uh, and then suddenly 5,000 bus drivers hit that simultaneously, you know what they get? Connection timed out, uh, and so that uh, that didn't bode well. Uh, whenever those folks were like, "Well, you told us this was the site that we had to come to," and so we have to be very, um, you know, liberal in thinking about the ways that we're going to be able to kind of accommodate that. So, so that was playing into, and in the, in the headless uh, WP piece came into play as a result of that as well as something that would enable us kind of that dexterity, if you will. So the next piece is just one more. Uh, really in the in kind of the grand step of, of what we're doing, um, you know, I, I probably don't need to say it, but I want to say it, and that is that you can probably tell from this, I'm a huge fan, both of WordPress, I see value in that, but I love the, the concept of the open source community. I always have, remember one of the initial books that you saw up there about me is that I'm a Linux dweeb, have been, you know, I'm proud to say my entire home environment uh, uh, runs off of Linux, so, uh, you know, and, and just because that's the only way I get to tinker uh, with these types of things. But, but true to that point, uh, being able to kind of show that these types of tools uh, that some may want to dismiss, uh, being able to kind of show that they truly do have utility, uh, not just in the consumer world, but really if you think about it in the huge enterprise world, we can actually see the, the massive utility of these tools to be able to not just do the job, but do the job very, very well. And that's critically important, you know, and that's what we should be about in the aspects of education. And so, again, as we've continued on with new things that we're thinking about and building, uh, you know, one of the big things that uh, the whole world is dealing with right now is, is the whole idea of, of employment attrition, right? Um, uh, Chris Clark, who is the president of the Chamber of Commerce for the Georgia, uh, was in a presentation with him about two weeks ago, and he really talked about, you know, that for every three employment opportunities, there's one person applying for that job right now. And education hasn't been spared of that, you know, for all the reasons of the pandemic and everything that's happening. And so you can imagine there's a huge conversation about saying, first off, how, how, do, we, how do we continue to attract people into this profession? Second piece is, is how do we keep them? And then the third piece is how do we continue to grow them? Because obviously there's 
uh, every aspect of society and everything that's happening with that is under a constant state of change. And now beginning to again think about the, the specifics of uh, the teacher and the network and the whole entire um, you know, genre of, of the employment aspect of that uh, really became a huge project for us. And so one of those pieces is really the awareness, right? Of, you know, you, if you don't know about it, it it's not even something that you're going to get involved in. And so really beginning to think about, first off, uh, how do we tell teachers about job openings that are out there? You know, there's tons of teachers uh, that are certified. They're, they're not working or they're working in some other avenue of that. And certainly we want to make them uh, aware of the instances where we have that. And, you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but certainly some of our metro area schools uh, may still continue even this far into the school year to may, you know, they may have 100 employment openings even at this moment in time. I hope it's not. I, I hope I'm overstating that, but I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but we began to kind of conceptualize on this idea of saying, what if we put in place something that we would call a teacher retention site where we could put information that's palatable to them, it's useful for them, but it would also show them, you know, what we are doing from the agency's perspective uh, to support them as the professionals that they are, but give them an opportunity uh, to, to look for, for whatever that we have there, be it from teacher recognition all the way through to career advancement through, you know, professional learning opportunities where, uh, and, uh, you know, again, so I'm, I'm a teacher. I, I have what's called a T level, an S level, and an L level certificate. And that's because I started as a teacher. I ultimately went into the service field as a, as a network engineer and then uh, ultimately became in the in the leadership role and so those were the career opportunities that that befell my path as I got to the point where I'm at today same thing happens in the midst of this as we see teachers go into the profession uh, you know by the time they get to the 10 or 15 year profession oftentimes they're thinking you know uh, maybe I want to do something else well we want to do what we can to keep them in that field because they have a lot of uh, historical and longitudinal knowledge and so again, that's what this site is going to do is really be something specifically built for them with a conceptualized idea of saying, you know, what information is critical for you? Um, and that's what we're going to kind of put inside of the midst of that. And so that one's just, uh, again, that one's still in the kind of design phase, but again, it's, yeah. it's going to kind of roll out in the, in the whole regiment of time associated with the update of the website there. So, yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, I don't remember my next slide. So, all right, here we go. Um, so uh, security and safety. Um, well, before questions, because yeah, you want to. Yeah, actually, I, we let's see. We're thirty-five minutes in. Why don't we just go ahead and go into into Q and A? Okay. Uh, see if anybody has anything. That'd be that'd be fine. Micah. <laughs> I I can't I, I was told I need to repeat one. the question but I don't know if I can say the word that Micah just said so what what was what was the word he wanted to know how you're multiplexing orthogonal so, frequency that's that's 16 points on the sine wave in case you yeah I got that. I'm, I'm not smart enough to, say, to know, got, to know that I got nothing so I got nothing, yeah so. I got nothing yeah I got, so. I got nothing so yeah, it doesn't play in there, but you know, so I, I use that a good bit at the agency because sometimes people like, you know, you, you, you take people over there in technology services, you're weird, you know, like we are, uh, because this is our conversational topic. When we sit around at lunchtime, we're like, hey, anybody done anything interesting with orthogonal frequency division multiplexing? And everybody's like, just shut up. I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> it's, it's a great conversation killer whenever we need it from that standpoint. So, yeah, yeah. So. But... You know, obviously, you know, from the CMS side, uh, there's there's lots of complexities of that. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, just a testament to all of you and the work that you do, uh, you know, sometimes people don't necessarily understand uh, the, the, the industry that you're in and the skills that you bring to play. Uh, that is, uh, it, it's, it's definitely one of my jobs uh, to make sure that people recognize that, you know, you, you didn't wake up this morning and sit down in front of a bowl of cereal and say, "Hey, I'm going to do WordPress today." No, it took a lot of so uh, some. Sweat. Some people do that. Sweat. Really? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, there's probably at least I've, I've done it before. Yeah, but, a lot of you sweat know. equity went into that, and you know, there, there, it really is. Uh, again, the last session that I was in, where uh, the whole planning uh, conversation that 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 leads up to really kind of the performance piece and the ability for it to really be. Uh, you know, kind of tangential to what's happening within the organization and strategic priorities it takes a lot of planning. But in order for that planning to happen, 
you bring a huge skill set. Uh, and so it's really pivotal for us really right now in the world to say, you know, technology, you know, the, the, the mission criticality is really dependent upon those people. Uh, make sure that whenever you're planning, they're, they're sitting at the table with you, you know, so. I didn't answer your question. I didn't either. I didn't either, but, I'm gonna, I, I didn't yeah. either, but I'm it's gonna, okay. I'm gonna move on. Yeah. <laughs> Karina. Um, so when you take a system that has this much age in it and an and the organization is large as the Department of Education, how have you handled um, onboarding the users and 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 monitoring their their satisfaction with the changes that have been made, you know, because it's a lot of people are very resistant to this kind of a change. They, they absolutely you, are. Can you rephrase? Re, yeah, or, or, so so the question was, uh, whenever you're working with an organization this large, obviously uh, kind of changing, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase you, so you correct me if I'm wrong, but how do you change the culture? Because uh, people, once they get comfortable with, the, with using something and comfortable seeing that and comfortable with the information, and then your mavericks come in and say, we're going to change everything overnight, how, how do you deal with that? Um, and, and the answer to that is that long before anybody knew that there was going to be a change of Godot.org, uh, you, you start at the, at the strategic level of steering in, within the organization, uh, who are obviously the deputies of, of all the other divisions, and you say to them, uh, we're going to be doing this work and here's the reason why. Uh, and then specifically within my, within my leadership team, uh, I have one lady, her name is Joyce Beard, uh, and she is the Director for Knowledge and Resource Management. Her job is to do nothing more than really kind of prepare people for a cultural change, and then she helps them understand and implement that. And that happens, honestly, probably a year in advance of before anybody even really begin to kind of know, because to that point, you're, you're saying uh, nobody likes change. Nobody likes change. Uh, once we get comfortable with something, even if it's incorrect, we're like, I don't want to change it. Uh, and so really to, to kind of come in uh, and really kind of change a culture and say, I want you to be comfortable with change. I don't want you to be comfortable with, with not change. I want you to be comfortable with that. There really has to be two things. Obviously, in advance of that, we have to market and evangelize uh, the changes that are coming. And then the second thing is we have to slip in up underneath them a very secure safety net that says, as we change, there's going to be somebody that's going to travel right beside you. There's going to be SMEs that are going to help you understand this and the new processes. Uh, and then obviously, you know, we have project managers that are going to be amidst of this. And the, and the whole realm of, of a small army uh, really begins to kind of uh, circle the wagons around the totality of the teams to just kind of help them get comfortable with the fact that new things are coming. Critically point, uh, a, a, an excellent question, because oftentimes that's missed. You know, um, we, we were talking a, a few days ago about, you know, what, what happens in the enterprise in the world of development. And if you think about it, a lot of people think that, that you as developers, that you're just really like an army of one. And in my organization, you're not. There's going to be a whole army of people. There's going to be a PMP. There's going to be a BA. There's going to be a technical writer. There's going to be QA. There's somebody that's monitoring you at. There's going to be an infrastructure person. They're, they're a part of your team. And so all those pieces, nobody sees that they happen, but they're there. They have to be critically because um, a developer can't do all those types of things and really us be able to deliver an MVP on an agile time frame. And so getting those pieces um, and, and getting people comfortable with the idea of, of we got it. You, you just continue to do your work and we're going to help you um, find ways to kind of triage and transition your job role. So that, did that answer? Anything yeah, that's add? it. I mean, to, to me, to simplify it, you just have to get buy-in from, uh -huh. from, from the people that are at the top and, and eventually trickles down. So See the difference? See, the, the answer buy-in was the perfect thing. <laughs> so, this is what happens whenever you get a politician in front of you. Like, we're going to take 45 <laughs> minutes to say the word buy-in. Okay, buy-in is the answer. I just have a very low vocabulary, uh, so I couldn't uh, use big words. Just, That's why it, Micah's uh, question really uh -huh. tripped me up. There, so, but. Other questions? I just learned a lot from the work at Sandville, and I know that there's mention of, um, I think this might be a security question, but um, we have members on the site, um, and are part of the site. So right now, when everybody logs in, they use one password, but they're saying that they need to transition to everybody having an individual login. 
So I didn't know people just get some insight on how they change and how Is the site um, currently a WordPress site? And I'll rephrase the question just so, it, so the mic picks it up. But is it a WordPress site currently? So the question the question was um, right now they have a um, a WordPress uh, site where uh, each person has um, not I guess there's one login for everyone and they sh they share that uh, do you want to I mean I know I know at Godot you that would never never fly do you want to yeah. well so let, let's we're going to tag team this because okay. we really there's two pieces of this there's an administrative answer and there's a technical answer okay I'm going to take on the administrative and then you go into the technical saying. Okay. Yeah, and, and we're gonna we're gonna wonder out loud right now. Are you the administrator of your site? Okay, that's good. Uh, we we okay we we can work with that. We we already got growing ground. So the, so the first thing is is that as you can imagine, uh, any time that you're on the public internet, there's gazillions of of bad guys out there that are just really trying to hammer that site and see if they can just take control of it. Not because. It, and, and you may think in your mind there, there's really nothing that's, you know, worthy of industrial espionage or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. It's just really the street cred of being able to say, I took down a site. Uh, and so from that standpoint, you can imagine that really the entry point is who's coming to that site. And so uh, if, if you can't find ways to create that uniqueness of them, either be through IP management or, you know, who is the individual and those types of things, that's your first problem because the minute that that happens, you don't necessarily have any forensic data that will enable you to kind of backtrack and see where those problems are at. And so again, going back to something we've said twice here, this is where planning is going to help with that performance piece where you really need to sit, sit down. And this is what we would call the governance layer where we begin to think about not just what the site's doing, but really, you know, how do we make it palatable to the individual users? And that's another piece of this is really, you know, the experience that people are coming to that site for. They're coming to, to either provide information or share information or maybe glean information from that. And so if we don't begin to kind of look at that dynamic nature of what Web 3.0 is right now, we may miss that opportunity from that. And so there's a security piece that I think about, but secondarily to that is that I'm trying to make sure that we're thinking about the individual user and try and find ways to kind of customize that experience. So if you're using a single user and a single password, you can see where if Aaron and I are logged in, and I, and I love green, well, he does too, but anyway, did, that's not yeah. a good example. But you know, from that standpoint, I'm like, I'm going to change my background to green, and then he logs in, he's like, I hate green, he changes it to blue, and then I log back in, and I'm like, who in the world did that? I hate you. I'm going to change it back to green. This is where we want to customize that. But that, the more important piece really right now is I know without even knowing what your site is. I know there's somebody out there that's just trying to hammer it right now. And so really that critical piece of making sure that you've put up a good gate in front of that is really the most important aspect of that. And so how would we control that? We would control that with technical and that would be when. Yeah, so to me, one of the um, things, I you've probably sent that username and password to a slew of people. How many people have, have that username and password? Yeah, three hundred. Okay, wow, that's good. so all it takes I mean, is one, you know, one person's email to get hacked, um, and then that um, it's an admin user. I'm assuming um, where if you have three hundred users, chances are not every single one of them need um, admin rights. They might need editor role or um, uh, I can't think of the the roles, right? I'll just I'll just stick with editor. Um, you might just need editor right now. So the I would I would make sure that the people, the three hundred people, only have the access that they need. Um, and that way, you can also there's plugins like uh, Stream um, that keeps track of each user and what they're doing. Um, that can that can come in handy too. So if if the site is um, the content is deleted or something, you'll have a log of that. If you're all logging in as admin um, and, and you have stream installed, you're still going to have that. Um, you're still not going to know who did it, who broke the site. Um, but go ahead. You. Um, actually, the, the members only have like informational access to that. Um, and that's what I mean by the admin role. Ah, OK, uh -huh. that's not. I mean, okay, that that doesn't scare me quite as quite as as badly. Okay, 
I was I was like super nervous for a second there. If it's just a password for a page, is that or a section? Okay. Okay. That that's not near. I thought I thought you were talking like three hundred people have access to that ad administration. Um, okay. Then I'm I'm not. I, I can sleep better. So thank you. Um, like second round of tones is about yeah, to yeah. out right now. So yeah, I was going. I was nervous. So um, the next question or is is there? Yes. Along the same topic, form spam. Hmm? I get dozens of form spam every day. Recapture the only thing I use is still spam. How do you get rid of it? So there's um, what form plugin are you using? Okay, um, I'm not familiar with that, but um, so the, the question was uh, form uh, spam. Um, you're getting a lot of that. Um, there, there's a couple different ways to, to block that. Um, I use um, in your plugin, I'm just not familiar with the plugin you're talking about, but I use Gravity Forms and I use um, the um, reCAPTCHA uh, plugin uh, version three because version three is better than version two. Um, version three basically runs uh, in the background. It doesn't do the "Are you a human?" you know check checkbox. It runs a JavaScript uh, script in the in the background. Um, but one of the things um, that I think everybody should be using uh, if if your infrastructure allows Godot's different. Um, but I have most of my clients using Cloudflare. Um, in Cloudflare is for for DNS uh, is completely free. Now they try to um, tell you to use the twenty dollar plan. Um, I have about one hundred and eighty five uh, sites that are on Cloudflare that are on the free plan, and it has a really cool um, tool that basically um, you just you turn it on. It's literally a checkbox. Uh, once you've migrated your DNS over, you turn turn it on, and it does a bot blocking. Uh, tool, and that will wipe out a lot of your spam because a lot of the spam is coming from, I shouldn't say well-known IP addresses, but Cloudflare, because they have so many uh, millions of websites on Cloudflare, they can look and say, we're getting from these IP addresses, we're getting tons of spam, um, so they can start blocking those IP addresses. So to me, Cloudflare is cost you nothing. You know, to to use it. So to me, you know, why why not? And that um, that normally, once I have the recapture on there and Cloudflare, it's not it's not a problem for for most of my clients. An, an important piece to consider is that you know. So he's talking about a solution that's upstream of that. Obviously, we know that there are plugins available and those types of things. But you see, that's a it's kind of as they say, a horse of another color. Uh, so let me ask this question. So are your, the users that are coming to your site, are they kind of organically driven there or do you have like a specific use base? Is there a, a frequent domain of, of email that oftentimes comes to you or is it just really just kind of like anywhere, everywhere? The good ones are varied. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's tough, obviously, you know, the minute that we put a node on the public you know, World Wide Web without you doing something akin to like some content, some uh, continent blocking, which obviously there's features, you know, some somebody may say, you know, hey, uh, we, we, we don't want the entire country of Turkey to see our website. So we'll just, you know, we can put features in place that do IP blocking and IP block ranges from there. Uh, if you're able to kind of look and do some analysis that that's specifically where your spam levels are coming from. But again, you know, the other piece is to look at your firewall in front of that, see if it's got some advanced functionality, some pieces that let me look for, you know, test for the presence of an SPF record or those things, you know, that we, we would expect to see a mature, uh, a professional email domain be able to kind of uh, present in advance to say we're, we're, we are, we are legitimate. You know, oftentimes, you know, again, some tools in front of that. Because uh, the big piece here is that, you know, if you've got a smaller site, uh, you can probably put those uh, the pressure on your WordP to be able to your WordPress to be able to do those. But if it's something that's growing, you know, here's an opportunity for us to begin to think about what's what else exists within your network that really can kind of take that load away, and we can deal with that before it ever even gets to your site from there. So, yeah, Micah. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment too. 
they've shown now that AI is going to solve 85% of yep. Yep. Uh, yep. the recaptures. Sure. So I can only imagine uh, that the upstream solution seems like mm -hmm. a, a better option to this scenario. It's just because uh, I think we're entering a time where I think I'm going to just quote from David Walsh that said that with a blank form input on your farm and you tell who you use them I think that kind of piggybacks off of what Micah said. Mm -hmm. I think I think that with AI and stuff like that is gonna be um, it's almost useless to it's getting where where bots can process that. Um, but yeah, so, they can hire mechanical to do it. Yeah, I, I, literally, I was just going to say, you know, from that standpoint, you know, there's this, this conversation about what's the difference between AI and machine learning. It, it really nothing. And if you think what's machine learning, it's just really the opportunity for a computer to figure out all the steps necessary to complete a task that otherwise a human would do. Uh, you know, the short of it is that you build a better mousetrap, they're going to build a better mouse. And so this is, we're, we're not going to get to that point anytime soon. Uh, obviously, as Mike was saying, things like AI and stuff like that are going to definitely test us, uh, you know, because uh, obviously we're still in the very, the, the, the Sputnik era, as I like to call it in regards to some of those tools, but they're they're growing at such rates and leaps and bounds that they're kind of leapfrogging the ability for some of our most uh, advanced tools to be able to kind of protect our networks and stuff like that. It's definitely the piece that keeps us up at night. Yeah, so. Cool, we got one more. Time for one more. Yeah, um, I think using headless helps with this, but for the sites that aren't headless, like maybe the membership site, uh, like how do you guys vet plugins that you're going to use on there? Or like if I'm, as a plugin author, how can I tell y'all that my plugin's kind of price or anything? Like what should I do? Like, so, more likely to use our plugin? so the question was uh, for, uh, as, a, as a plugin developer, um, how do someone like me that vets Plugins. How how do I make it look like it's or or make it uh, appear to be a good a good plugin that I would want to use? Um, that to me just boils down to um, I always look at the ratings um, on when, when I go to a plugin. I look at the ratings. Um, I make sure that it's getting a certain amount of stars. I understand sometimes the star rating system. I mean, it's like Amazon, right? You know, they that. Most of the things on Amazon are bought. I mean, like if you're getting four stars, it's because they're paying people to buy the product um, and stuff like that. Uh, you don't have quite that so much in in the WordPress community, but I mean, that's you know, if it if we're getting zero one star, you know, I'm going to be like, no. Um, the amount of downloads is important, and really the 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 thing that's different for um, like my my agency, I've got developers like Marty and and Chris and other people that I'll I'll say. Hey Marty, go go look at this plugin and make sure that they know what they're doing. Um, because no offense to the the ecosystem, there's a lot of stuff in there that's just not built the right way. Um, in <laughs> um, so um, so I I just I get a developer on it. Um, and to to be honest, I I would tell like if you don't know um, um, if a plugin's any good. Word camps are great. Get a get a developer. And be like, hey, can you spend thirty minutes and just let me know if this plugin's any good? Um, that that that's the way way I I vet things. So, and we are out of time yeah. as of now. So, thank you. Thank you all. Great question.